You're listening to the Brave Arrangers podcast, a new way of talking politics. I'm today's host, John Wood Jr. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are back on the Brave Rangers podcast. Today is a particularly significant episode, in my opinion. Um, I am joined by two individuals who are well known in and beyond their circles, uh, Mr. Bob Woodson and Mr. Hawk Newsom. Bob and Hawk are two of the most significant um, voices in, I could say, in America, certainly in Black America and in the context of, of, of our conversation over what the future direction is of, of Black America and in relationship to the quest for justice, the quest for equality, and the current uh, controversies of the moment. And so I could have started off this conversation by saying, you know, having a dialogue here between a, a Black conservative, Black liberal, that would be utterly inadequate in terms of explaining who these men are, what they've done, and setting the context for this dialogue. And so Bob Woodson, Bob Newsom, welcome to you both. First of all, how are you gentlemen? Good, pleased to be here. <laughs> I am uh, quite well, quite well. Uh, thanking God for the day. Um, happy to be here with you both. Okay, fantastic. Um, I wanna go ahead and for the benefit of our audience, I wanna do something that's gonna sound a bit like a, a formality, but I actually consider it an important part of today's, uh, today's show, so to speak, because I want people to have a sense of who you guys are, who you gentlemen are professionally, your credibility on these issues as a means of framing this conversation, uh, frankly, framing this conversation in the context of the Black conversation and the historic kind of dialogue that's taking place within the Black community over the way in which we pursue civil rights and so uh, the way in which we pursue rights and justice. So to start off, Hawk Newsom, and Hawk, you can correct me on anything I get wrong in this, uh, in this introduction here. <laughs> Hawk Newsom is the president of Black Lives Matter of Greater New York. A Bronx native and a once high school dropout, Newsom is a graduate of Concordia College who would later attend Howard University Law School and who would complete his Juris Doctorate at Truro Law School in Long Island. In his early career, Mr. Newsom worked in the Bronx County Office of the District Attorney as a paralegal assisting in criminal prosecution. In that office, Hawk would also serve as liaison to the New York City Housing Authorities, tenants associations, and social services organizations throughout the Bronx. While engaged in this work, Hawk organized drives to send medical supplies to communities in need in Haiti and the Dominican Republic. While working at the law firm of Wilson, Elser, Moskowitz, Edelman, and Dicker as a projects manager coordinating activities in 22 national and international offices, Hawk founded the Bronx, Shark, uh, the Bronx Sharks Athletic Club, responsible for sending numerous at-risk youth to college on scholarship. In 2013, Hawk would join Justice League New York City, quote, a multidisciplinary task force of juvenile and criminal justice experts, artists, educators, direct service providers, activists, and formerly incarcerated individuals brought together under the auspices of the Gathering for Justice, a social justice organization founded by Harry Belafonte. Um, Hawk, is there anything uh, critical that you'd like to add to that? Um, father, Christian. Parents met at a civil rights rally, um, no longer with Justice League and no longer the president of Black Lives Matter Greater New York. I am the chair. Our group is now led by a 20-year-old uh, Black woman named Paul Kiazolu, who attends Hampton University and maintains a 3.7 GPA. Leading beside her is my sister, Shivana Newsom. So... Um, I, I have a loud mouth, but I am not the leader of this organization. I support the sisters as the black woman is the key to our liberation. Mm, okay, thank you for those clarifications. Um, now Bob Woodson. Bob Woodson is the founder and president of the Woodson Center and the 1776 Unites Initiative. Mr. Woodson was born in Philadelphia in 1937, raised by a widowed single mother alongside four brothers and sisters. Bob is also a former high school dropout who would go on to study math and science at Cheney State College in Westchester, Pennsylvania, and obtain a master's degree in social work from the University of Pennsylvania following time spent working with juvenile offenders in the local prison. 
While pursuing doctoral studies at the University of Massachusetts, Bob became involved in the work of the Civil Rights Movement, where he met and worked with leading figures, including the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. During these years, Bob directed and coordinated activities for many community-based organizations, including the NAACP. Breaking with the mainstream of the movement in part over disagreements over forced integration, Bob would later head the National Urban League's Administration of Justice Division in New York City in 1971, then headed the American Enterprise Institute's Revitalization Project in Washington, D.C. He would form the National Center for Neighborhood Enterprise in 1981. By the way, Hawk, Bob is just a little bit older than you and I are, so his bio is just a little <laughs> bit older. <laughs> Um, in the 1980s, Woodson would advise the Reagan administration as head of the Council for a Black Economic Agenda, where one of his accomplishments was to help tenants of D.C. public housing projects obtain millions of dollars in federal funds to repair housing complexes and organize a tenant, a tenant management plan. In the 1990s, uh, the NCNE would establish an economic training center in South Africa to foster market-oriented economic development among Black South Africans. Woodson would also advise the George W. Bush administration in the 2000s. The work of the Woodson Center continues from 1981 to this day, credited with the implementation of violence-free zones that have saved lives in urban communities across America, programs advancing financial literacy, and resident management services equipping public housing residents to participate in, quote, first right of refusal. Uh, deals with local real estate developers who wanted to sell their, uh, that is to say, with equipping uh, residents uh, with first right of uh, refusal uh, in deals with local real estate developers who wanted to sell their public housing on the open market. The Woodson Center was, quote, instrumental in getting housing legislation passed to empower public housing residents to collectively purchase and manage properties and determine their own destinies. Uh, Bob, is there any correction or anything that, uh, that ought to be added to that, to that summary? Uh, no, I, I think that's pretty complete that 80 percent of my closest friends have letters in front of their names instead of letters in back of their names. Right. So, <laughs> Yeah, understood. So, um, yeah. yeah, indeed. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure and an honor for me to be able to refer to both of you individuals as friends. We are here, however, uh, sort of in a momentous moment uh, for the country, uh, for Black America. Um, and I think that there's a feeling that the country is, things are sort of up in the air with respect to where the country can go, broadly speaking, and to the direction in which Black America may go. But wherever it goes, uh, it is going to be in part owing to the leadership of individuals like, like yourselves, right? Um, and so part of what I want to understand and allowing us to understand each other in the context of this conversation is sort of what has shaped us um, in terms of how we, and how you gentlemen specifically, um, see how you guys see the world, how you see the, the struggles of the, the black community and what has defined your work. Is there a, a story or an anecdote that, um, that you guys would be able to share that shines a little bit of light on your evolution uh, in the context of this work? Uh, Bob, is there, is there a tale you can tell? Yeah, um, I guess uh, when I uh, was a young civil rights activist in Westchester, Pennsylvania, the home of uh, Baird Rustin, um, I was uh, struck with the fact that uh, I, we led demonstrations for two months outside of a pharmaceutical com company, and when they desegregated, they hired nine black PhD chemists. When we asked these brothers and sisters to join us, they said they got these jobs because they were qualified, not because of what we were doing. Mm. That happened two or three more times. Then I realized that a lot of people who struggled and sacrificed most in the struggle for civil rights did not benefit from the change that when the doors of opportunity were open, middle-class people like myself and others were walking through that door. Uh, Dr. King said, what good does it do to have the right to eat in a restaurant of your choice or to live in a neighborhood if you don't have the means to exercise that right? And so I concentrated my efforts on low, dealing with low-income people uh, and preparing them to take advantage of opportunity, but also, uh, ran into sports busing for integration. I opposed it. And so some of the other leaders said, well, you taking the same position as the Klan and the John Birch Society. And so I learned mm -hmm. early on that if you pursue the truth, it doesn't matter who agrees or disagrees with you. You got to pursue the truth. Because I, and so uh, in 1965, there was a column written by the, Bill Raspberry who said, 
poor Negroes are not benefiting from the change in the civil rights movement. And so I began to work on behalf of low income people. And I believe that you cannot generalize about all black people, that they are low income blacks uh, have been, I think, used by a lot of middle class so-called leaders, uh, use their demographics. And when the resources arrive, it didn't go to them, it benefited. That's why the biggest income gap is not between whites and blacks, it's low income blacks and upper income blacks. And so I spent my life working on behalf of and directly in uh, empowering low income blacks to develop uh, uh, self-sufficiency, resident management. I've been a lot with gang intervention. We have examples of how we were able to uh, reduce gang violence in some of the most violent neighborhoods in Washington, DC. And we can talk about that later, but in, in essence, I believe that there is no single black America and that in generalizing like that, low income blacks always come out on the losing end when we generalize it back. We use their demographics to generate resources that don't help them. Hmm. Uh, Hawk, I see, uh, I believe that the wheels are turning, um, turning in your mind and you get a chance to respond to some of the, some of the themes and points Bob has made. Um, but we'd like to hear your story. Is there a story that you can tell that shines the light on the man that you've become and how you see the world in this context? Well, um, the wheels were turning, but um, I was digesting as opposed to preparing to a, assert a counter argument that was um, pretty profound. And um, I was just really digesting that. Um, I don't know, I, I do a lot of work you know, on the front lines, dealing with the front line of racism, of white supremacy, which is policing in our communities. That's the front line, most one of the most violent lines. So um, I recall working in the district attorney's office and um, I was fresh out of college and I'm a professional and I'm very social. So I was cool with so many people in our office. It, you know, they're, they're our friends. The, the staff, the administrative staff used to always say things like, they treat you like you're one of them, being one of the attorneys, as opposed to one of us, you know? And um, that's just that, that hierarchy in that office. But I remember how I lived two blocks away from, I lived two blocks away, sorry, we lived in a very busy space. Um, I remember how I would go home and change after work and take off my suit and tie. And I'd put on my hoodie and my Jordans and I'd take my Rottweiler for a walk. And I'd walk up on those same colleagues and they would say, um, and they would be startled, like, oh, I thought you were, you know, I thought you were one of them from the community. Yeah. I am one of them. I just am able to put on a suit and work like many of us are. So in that district attorney's office, I saw firsthand what racism in the judiciary system looked like from cops uh, bragging about beating people up if they ran to any time I saw a resistant arrest file I would see people with staples in their heads, stitches or, or bumps and bruises. Um, two supervisors in that office who would say, think, you know, you hear a young district attorney walk into that room and say, well, this fella did nothing. This, this woman did nothing. There's nothing there. And the supervisor would say something like, look at his record. He did something, find out what it was. So. I have firsthand knowledge of this injustice, injustice system. And um, I think while I was there, it, it, it just turned something in me. And um, to the point where I just didn't want to work there anymore. You know, I, I just really didn't want to work there anymore. So there is racism throughout that system. I've seen it firsthand, like in depth, I've worked in it. And um, that, I think that was a, definitely a turning point in my life. Now, in listening to the stories that each of you told, and you know, knowing a little bit about you both, um, 
but learning more and more, of course, as we go. Um, it occurs to me that, one, I suspect that you would each probably agree that while there were tremendous strides that were made during the civil rights movement and, you know, whatever the differences between, you know, the three of our I think that we are admiring of the work of King and the veterans of that era. And obviously, Bob, you are one of them. Um, but I think that you would both agree that many problems were left unsolved. Where I see the two of you have so much in common because you're both fingers in the dirt, grassroots level men who have interacted with folks white and black in positions of political and economic influence and so forth. And I, I think I've seen each of you try to use those connections to the benefit of all people, but certainly, certainly of black people. Where I see a split in the broader kind of black conversation, and you see this in the American conversation in general too, is this question over whether or not the, the problems of the black community are more sort of systemic or are they more are they more cultural, right? And what strikes me as a little bit tragic um, is, from my perspective, is that well, it's possible for two things to be true at the same time to one degree or another. But Bob, your focus in your career uh, has had a lot to do with giving people the skills to empower themselves, the work ethic, and the understanding of entrepreneurialism, the marketplace, and the basic sorts of cultural foundations for family and success that allow folks to survive and prosper regardless of what's going on in the system or what's going on with the band. And you have said, Bob, that you will work with anybody uh, to, advance, to advance that cause and those interests. Hawk, uh, the thing that you are famous for, the thing that you are known for, although you've done other things clearly, but as an actor, called attention uh, from your own perspective to the corruption of the system, certainly what folks would refer to as the police state, um, and also um, of the political sort of establishment. The question I want to ask you both is, do you, guys see, do you guys see a contradiction between on the one hand saying that we have to uplift the cultural practices of the black community as a way of self-determining our success? Is there a contradiction between that on the one hand and saying, let's look at the policies and practices of the political system and see how things can be reformed to open up avenues to success. And uh, what is the balance there? Um, Bob, can you, uh, can you field that question first? Yeah, well, let me, let me just preface it by saying what is missing today that existed during my era was the quality of the debate within the black community as to the way forward. Mm, right. uh, the civil rights movement itself fractured on the issue of strategy. Dr. King and others wanted to pursue a legal strategy. The students at Greensboro said, no, direct action. So, and then you got SNCC and you got Stokely and you got Malcolm, you got Elijah Muhammad, the Republic of New Africa. You had this fracturing, which was healthy. Uh, that, that debate is missing today. There, 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 there's no debate uh, within the black community as to the way forward, it's discouraged. The other part that's missing today is this whole notion when we're talking about Black America, we never talk about what responsibility uh, uh, do people have for, for changing themselves, regardless of what their external barriers are. But what is, when Hawk talked about his interaction at people at the law firm, and he saw racism up close, most of the young men that I work with, like in Benning Terrace, where there were 53 murders in a five square black area in two years because of these warring factions. And we organized ex-defenders and we went in there and brought these young men to my office. And then we were able to uh, uh, reduce that to the point where we didn't have a single gang murder for 12 years. And then we were take those young men and redirect their lives. So they were rebuilding the community they tore up. None of them have any interaction with white people at all. They had never been down to the Potomac River to a restaurant. And so, but we were able to emphasize to them that you can control your neighborhood. And so we were able to transform them from predators to ambassadors of peace. And so I don't see any emphasis today 
on communicating to people inside the community that you have agency, you've got control of yourself, only you. There's no, there's no talk about personal responsibility. It's everything is external. Whatever happens to you is because of what white people have done, are doing, and will do for you. And that to me is a very crippling message to say to people, your destiny is determined by people changing who don't like you. Bob, it's a quick follow on. Uh, it's a quick follow on to that. Do you think that there is nevertheless um, a role for 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 bringing attention to the corruption of the system, whatever the problems may be in the police departments? We could talk about the details about what that is or is not. But do you see a role for activism uh, in the path forward for for Black America? Obviously, not negating uh, everything else that you've emphasized. Yeah, it, yeah, I do. We need to uproot corruption. But corruption isn't just being practiced by white people. You look at Kwame Kirkpatrick, uh, who, who led a criminal organization in City Hall for 10 years, and 40 of his people uh, went to prison. But that's not, uh, it, so I think that's, corruption is bad. But it's always low-income blacks are the ones who are hurt by that corruption. It doesn't matter whether the people who are corrupt are black or white. But by always looking at it through a racial prism, we allow black corruption like what's happening there. And I can name uh, 20 such examples from my experience. But we don't talk about that. It's, it's, we, we almost exempt them from any responsibility because Evo has to wear a white face before we get upset about it and willing to do something. When Evo wears a black face, it escapes any uh, responsibility of changing it. Hawk, I appreciate um, Hawk, I appreciate Bob's point about the need for the debate within uh, within the community. And uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, now I won't yeah, sound like an ageist when I say this, sir. You couldn't be any more wrong. You could not be any more wrong. This is not monolithic. This is a multi-tiered, multi-faceted movement. You have communists, you have socialists, you have Democrats, you have anarchists, you have black folk, right? You have black folk who believe that black economics is the way to go. You have black folk that believe that fighting this criminal justice uh, uh, system is the way to go within that system. You have people who don't want to point the, the finger as much as the police and the judiciary system and want to talk about the penal system. Now, with you being a, a man who is well-versed and very educated, uh, owe it to yourself and the people who listen to you to find out what those arguments are. It sounds to me like you're just relying upon the news and you couldn't be any more disrespected or um, 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 di misguided. Last night, uh, we were out at City Hall and there was a debate as to how to move forward. You got thousands of people out there with different views. Some people, I, I won't go into what the philosophies were, but there are a lot of different people who want to do a lot of different things. But we voted on that. Um, and this is, this is what this movement is. You have what you call reformists in this movement who want to kiss political behind, show up with politicians and play nice and take that slow process. Then you have other people who are revolutionaries who are like, we demand change now. There's a lot of different people in this movement and you're speaking to someone who spent almost every day of the last six years in it here throughout this country and across seas. So when, when you say that, there, that there's no, there's no uh, uh, it's not fractured and how the fracturing was healthy, that means you have no idea about what's happening out here. There are groups that focus on women leadership. There, there, there are groups that focus on LGBTQ plus leadership. There are groups where, where men lead. There's just so much out here, so many different 
uh, schools of thought that it's um that 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 you just you just you you broad stroke and because you have a large audience you're miss well, directly good. you're definitely yeah, let me, let me, let me, no 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 I just want I just want to I, yeah. I just want to finish sir because I, I let you finish I let you go through your whole spiel the fact that you would call people predators it bothers me to my core because black people have to be be conscious of using words and phrases that racists use. You had people like Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden who called our young kids super predators. Think about the psychology. The psychology of that is 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 frightening and it's also uh damaging. There's there's which you have to understand even going back to what I was saying before, you have old school Urban League, NAACP, Al Sharpton, and then you have new school leaders who are out there who think that they are part of the problem. You got young Republican blacks like Candace Owens who, who, who are out here, you know, fighting. Um, there are plenty of problems within our community, and yet again, you are not paying attention, sir, to the people who are in these communities doing anti-violence work. You're not paying attention to people like me, who you should have researched, who are talking about launching financial literacy programs and improving lives by our people. The problem is, sir, that the news wants to report us throwing our fist in the end, screaming back at the system, screaming back at the man. But when we're in our communities, uh, in 200 schools in the last three years, uplifting our children, teaching our killed children to have a setter, better self-image. When we're talking about black love, black pride, honoring the black woman, what do you right. think that is, sir? Like, like, what, what do you think? That's us promoting blackness. And, and what you express is, um, like, a lot of things you say are things that white racists throw at us. So I, I just urge you, with all due respect, to um, just be cognizant of your language and your phraseology, because you are reinforcing narratives of people who seek to keep black people oppressed. So, Hawk, I'm going to let uh, I'm going to let Bob respond, but I just want to insert a certain thing from my perspective here, very quickly, uh, because my perspective is is limited. I'm talking to you guys from. Uh, South Los Angeles uh, at a school that I sit on the board of directors for which services young black and brown kids. I'm a few miles from the Jordan Downs projects. I lived there for about a year or so, but I didn't grow up there. I grew up in multicultural middle class sort of Culver City and whatnot, right? And so, I mean, I'm a person who grew up with a fair amount of comfort and privilege, even while I had relatives who were distributed in much more difficult sorts of circumstances in inner city LA life. So I'm not gonna pretend that I've got a perfect overview of all of the conversations and interactions that are happening, happening in black America. But the thing that frustrates me sometimes, and it's possible that maybe I'm just not close enough to some of these conversations uh, as, you're, as you're accusing Bob of being, but what frustrates me sometimes is that on the one hand, when I talk to folks on a one-on-one -on -one basis, talk to either of you, I don't get the sense that there's any real contradiction necessarily between us wanting to uplift black folks culturally, but us also wanting to call attention to what's going on structurally. Where the argument comes in is what are the details of that, right? But I just went down, part of the reason why I went down your resumes to begin with is to show people that wherever you think about Bob Woodson's politics or Hawk Newsom's politics, these are deep and substantive men who have given themselves to the community. It doesn't mean that either one of you is right or wrong on any given issue, right? We could be in error. Uh, but what I want to see as an American and as a black man, as a black American, is the full coming together of the cultural and social resources, the intellectual resources, the capital that we have to move forward, right? And so, Hawk, I hear you saying that these conversations are, are happening, uh, but I also hear Bob, and Bob is a person with the wide network, right? Uh, Bob saying that he's not seeing, seeing as much of it. Bob, I wanna invite you to respond to what Hawk has said in, in, any, uh, in any particular way. Um, but if you can, if there's anything you also you wanna, you wanna say yeah, in yeah. terms of, you know, Let me say, uh, the cross section uh, I'm illustrating, yeah. go for it. Yeah. First of all, when, when I look, did research Black Lives Matter, I see a variety of expressions of it. One of them is Nashville says, we are about disrupting the Western nuclear family. It is Eurocentric, so I, we want to abolish that. We, uh, patriarchy, we want to abolish that. 
uh, globalism. Uh, it's uh, just, it, uh, it's all over the place about what they're against. And so that's what I, I find troubling, but also about my own self. In the last 38 years that I've had the center, we have 2,500 grassroots leaders uh, in 39 states. And some of them are when telling me about uh, what their, their priorities are when they see people gathered around the mayor, the home of the mayor of Washington, D.C., and 90% of them are white kids with a few blacks saying, I'm Black Lives Matter, and demanding that the police be defunded. And then when I go down in Ward 7 and 8 to a meeting and the parents say, we want the police, that by vilifying the police has resulted in an increase in black deaths around this country. I've documented it, the FDR, that when police are less aggressive in reinforcing the laws in those communities, the black death soars. I have a picture that I've tried to get ready for this of 30 black children under the age of 10 who have been killed in these cities, not by uh, racist cops, by other blacks. But those kind of issues are ignored when we get 14 people, uh, unarmed blacks who are killed by police, and that's a subject of, 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 of demonstration. And we don't seem to care about the, the babies are being lost in these communities. And so I, I have spent my time and my effort working. We have, we have in, in uh, stop violence in these communities. We've created islands of excellence. You can go on 60 Minutes and see it. So we have, we have documented evidence that when we go in these communities and work with the people from within, that we can reduce violence and improve the quality of life in these communities. So, so that's, that's my experience. I just want to jump right in there and say this to you, sir. When black people kill black people, black people go to jail, sir. When police kill black people, they are not punished, sir. When black people kill black people, black people go to jail, sir. But these police officers continue to kill us in, with impunity like they did when they hung us from trees and they posed from pictures with the KKK with badges on, sir. Now, I agree. We have a lot of white allies in the Black Lives Matter movement. Yes, we do. We appreciate that support. I didn't see, well, maybe it's, it's from what I saw, but I, you know, the civil rights movement had a lot of white supporters too, okay? Now, if we elect people to do a job for the people, and they do not do that job for the people, then the people have every right to show up at a house that the people pay for and demand justice. Why? Because these politicians come to our houses when they want our votes, don't they? When they need their position signed to get on the ballot, they come to our houses, don't they? They greet us where we are. However, when they're not doing their jobs and we greet them where they are, then it becomes a problem. I, I, it's it's so, so, so hypocritical. Now, you must understand this. Police officers go on work shortages when they are held accountable. When there's talks of holding them accountable, that's when police officers say, hey, you know what? Hands off, I'm not working. They swore an oath to protect the public what gives them the right? They swore an oath to obey the laws. What gives them a right to say, I'm not working because people seek to enforce those laws. I'm not working but because the public seems to want to push forward with laws that make sense that will help me do my job better. They, they have a problem with that. So a police, um, a police officer's work shortage is a, is a dereliction of their duty, sir. It is one of the most dishonorable things that they can do, sir, because they swore an oath to their state laws and to the Constitution that they will uphold the law. And they do not have the time to have temper tantrums, because if they had temper tantrums, then lives could be lost. And I'll end with this. Stop talking 
about crime if you're not talking about the root causes of crime. Because once again, it plays into that white supremacist, also that conservative narrative narrative that they throw at us. Oh, well, what about crime in your neighborhoods? Well, yeah. What about housing security? What about people worrying about how they're going to pay rent? What about uh, uh, people in, in, in their children's schoolings that, that uh, I believe the proper phrase is suck? Their schools suck. Anywhere that you go in any congressional district and you have a 40% dropout rate, it is not the parents. It is, it, it, it is not the, the environment. It is that school that's failing to teach our children uh, adequately. So let's, let's talk about all these circumstances. Uh, communities with the highest murder rate have the highest unemployment rate. And here's where we agree. Here's where we agree. We need to build up our people. However, while we're building, we need to keep the police's knees off our necks. We need to stop them from harassing them. Now, I grew up in the South Bronx. I grew up in the South Bronx in the height of the crack epidemic. Shootings outside my doors, all kinds of things going down, going on outside. I was never taught to look down or label anyone. I could, and this is my life today. I could walk one day and hold a conversation with killers and within hours be sitting at a table with a billionaire. This is my life. That's the duality of my life. And I don't judge anyone. I don't blame anyone, but I am very realistic about this. White supremacy and systemic racism are very real. And black people face harder circumstances than white people on any given day and twice on Sunday. Do we need to build up? Yes. Do we need to tear down white supremacy? Yes. I don't understand how it has to be one or the other. Well, let so me just say, let, let me just say a point of agreement with you. Go ahead, Bob. My point of agreement, police officers have a obligation to a higher obligation, a higher responsibility, because they have the power of the state. And they should be held to a higher standard than the rest of, the rest of us. I agree with that. And when they do commit crimes, they need to be punished severely. But I still think that facts matter too. Facts matter. And the reality is that uh, if you talk about lynchings, there were about 48,000 blacks lynched over a period of 40 years in the South. Blacks kill one another, that number, in nine months. So numbers do count and in incidents. And it, and, and it hasn't always been like you. You said that there is a relationship between unemployment and crime. Well, let's go back in history and look at what happened in 1930 to 1940 when we were in a depression, when the unemployment rate for whites was 25% and almost 40% for blacks, when racism was a fact of law and we had no voting rights, what was our response to it? Well, the response was we had a higher marriage rate than, than whites. Elderly people could walk in their communities without being fear of being murdered or assaulted by their grandchildren. And so if we were able to maintain control of ourselves and not engage in the, and also at from the turn of the century up into 1950, the incarceration rates of blacks was only about 25 to 30%. And so are you saying that, that, that conditions today where the, 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 uh, we, we are 13% of the population and 53% of the prisons that somehow that's related that right people are worse today than it was in the 1930s. So let's look at the facts and say, if we were able to not engage in, in, in behavior uh, to killing ourselves when we were hot 50% unemployed, when we had no voting rights and racism was a rule of law, we ought to look back and say, if we did it then, why not now? We closed the, the education gap between 1920 and 1940 in the South because we set up 5,000 schools. We closed it within six months. 
So my, my point is, looking back, if we, if we were able to uh, control ourselves and perform under those conditions, what's, why, why are we can't do it today? Most of those education systems that you complain about are being run by black people. If racism were the issue, why are kids failing in systems run by their own people? Wait, can I just I'll jump in right there? Then so, then so, so, so when, when Massa had a black slave whip another black slave, that mean that there was no racism in place? So you mean to tell me that, that, that a Democrat working for a white establishment that betrays his people is still not playing a hand in racism? That makes no sense to me, sir. That makes no sense to say I black people. I have no idea wanted, what you're talking but, but, about. Oh, I think, uh, let the, me the, the rewind. Point, the point that Hawk is let me rewind. Yeah, please, let me walk please, you I don't know what you're talking about. Slowly. Let me rewind and walk you through this slowly. Yeah, right go, now, yeah, New York this. City, schools are suffering, communities are suffering. We have black and brown leadership, right? And our schools are suffering, our neighborhoods are suffering. We have real estate developers. We have special interests who are non-black buying off our politicians. So what you're telling me is because it's black people out front that it's still not uh, racist uh, ramifications, that it's not white supremacist like ramifications. Is that what you're telling me? Because black people are at the head of it, are, are out front that there's not these white people behind them pulling their strings. And you talk to me about crime. If you research crime, in which I'm sure you have, there's poverty and there's the anxiety and the mental health issues that come along with that. Like, I, I, you told me to look at the facts. I'm inviting you to do the same thing. We live in a very different world. We live in a very different world. But you cannot ignore all of the determinants of criminal activity Right? And, and you take black people who live, who, 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 and compare them to white people who have similar financial circumstances, right? And that white community is safer. Why? Like, what is it? What is it that causes us to be behave like this? And this is, these are a number, a number, a number of factors. You know, it's, it's just so hard. Are you saying, let me ask you a question. Are you saying that in cities like Baltimore, Detroit, where blacks were the mayor's office, the police department, the school system, the housing authority, the healthcare system, the courts, the police, where majority of blacks have been in control for 50 years. Are you saying that these black officials are powerless to act in the best interest of their people because white people behind them are manipulating them? Is that what you're I'm asking you a question. You I think, I think, it's a, I, think I, I, I find it funny because um, I think it's a combination of things, sir. I think that there is the capitalism. Now, I, I myself, I am a champagne socialist. You, you know what a champagne socialist is? I believe that people can have whatever we want as long as there's nobody hungry or starving. I think that everybody should have health care. I think that everybody should have a free education. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that this is the problem. Like, you might sit there and look and think, oh, he's Black Lives Matter. He's with the Dems. I fucking, I'm sorry. I cannot stand the Dems. But the Republicans are a bunch of racists, right? Who endorse racists, who march alongside racists, who, so I, here, here's my thing. Don't broad stroke us. Don't broad stroke us. And to get back to what you're saying, black representation doesn't equate to black power. Like black representation doesn't equate to black power. When we say systemic racism, we start talking about wealth, which you said. We start talking about redlining. We start talking about all of these issues. We start talking about all of these issues. And as Dr. King said, you know, everybody loves Dr. King. You can't tell a man to pull his bootstraps up if he doesn't have a pair of boots. Well, let me just ask you again. In Chicago, and you know what that place like now, in 1929, 
Blacks had 731 businesses, $100 million in real estate assets with a 15% uh, out of wedlock birth. Tell me in the face of redlining and all those other things you make, how were we able to accumulate wealth and have stable, and I can run down every city that had hotels and they had uh, stable communities. Uh, how were we able to do that during the jury segregation when we were being lynched every day? How were we able to have, we weren't killing each other. We didn't have the black on black crime back in then. Tell me how we were able to do that back then and we can't do that now. Tell me, tell me why, why were we able to do it when we were literally uh, in segregation? Can you tell me, give me an answer to that. I believe we had a strong and black community. I believe that oh, black people, okay. I believe that we had a strong. Stronger. There you go. All right, now we we had, a, we had a strong and black community. Now, Thank you. right now, <laughs> we, okay. are, we are fractured, right? We All are right. fractured and there's not enough being done to but pull we did our it, people though, right? together. But, right. but here's the thing, here's the thing. This is what we're doing as Black Lives Matter New York, as Black Opportunities. We're trying to build Black community, right? And if you listen, everybody's talking about unity. We're just trying to figure out how to do it, right? And, and I'm gonna tell you, I could walk it better than I talk it. I could, I could show you better than I could tell you. Right, we're mm -hmm. trying to do that. Um, I like segregation. <laughs> we were straight in segregation. I just think they need to open up the opportunities. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think they needed to open up opportunities for us and let us have equal access. I don't think they had to let us uh, open up the, the floodgates and let all the qualified black folk run and leave the hoods. Like I, I don't, I don't, I don't think that necessarily no, benefited no, no, no. us. This no, no, but they, but they didn't. But I guess my this final question: If, okay. but if we were able to do that when they did not open opportunities, but we did it anyway, so why do they have to give us opportunity as a condition for us being self-developed? If we did it, they when don't. They, weren't, they don't. Well, then why? But, why are you saying that we? Wait. They have to open it up. Why did they have to do anything before we? Do I'm something? talking about segregation, sir. That don't don't take my words and blow them out of proportion. I was talking about segregation when they open up the gates and people ran out. Don't twist my words. Don't come at me like Fox News. I love you, black man. Don't do me like that, right? So what I'm saying to you is, while we're building our communities, they don't give us what they owe us. I want every right that every American has. I'm sorry, we built this country and we will get everything that we're entitled to. And I'm not talking about handouts or anything of the sort. You're going to give me what's mine. You're, gonna, you're not going to hand out apple pie to everybody sitting around the table. When you get the Hawk Newsome and black people be like, you can't have none. You must be out of your mind. Either I'm going to take that whole pie or I'm going to flip this table over. So, yes, while we, while we build this thing up, they're going to give us what's ours. Okay? They're going to give us what's ours. <laughs> Okay, gentlemen. Let me let me insert um, a, some perspective here from my own from my own limited point of view. Humble before each of you and the experience that you bring to, to the table, and immensely enjoying uh, this conversation. Um, I I hear both of you. I hear first of all, I hear both of you saying that corruption needs to be confronted and rooted out. I hear Hawk framing this in the context of white supremacy, and uh, that is not language that Bob would use but on a rubber meets the road sort of level, at least in principle, I see you two black leaders as agreeing on this as a necessity, but emphasizing these things in different proportions. I see Bob talking about the need for us to invest in and build up our communities, but listening to Hawk go on at length, it seems like a principle that Hawk endorses as well. And you guys even look at our past history prior to the civil rights movement as being an example of a time in which the cultural capital of the black community uh, was sufficient to help us elevate our material and our social progress even in the face of segregation. Now, my historical analysis might be, might be a little bit flawed, but one thing that I tend to think is that certain things did change after the 1960s. We don't have time to go into all the details, but conservatives talk about the welfare state and its impact on, on, on the black family. 
folks on the left are more likely to point out the fact that crack cocaine came into the community when nobody asked for that and had a devastating impact that invited the heavy hand of law enforcement to come in in a way that probably sets the stage for some of the relationships that we, that we see now. The historical analysis can vary. What I want us to get to is a place to where we can see the underlying merit of the different things that we're emphasizing. Hawk, I think that the world and the black community would be immensely more impoverished if it weren't for the work that Bob Woodson and folks like himself has contributed uh, to the cause, to the struggle. I mean, Bob's got a real and genuine track record of turning real lives around, you know? And if, if, if Bob weren't a man who, I mean, look, this is me, you know, showing my affection for both of you here. If Bob weren't a man who wasn't wholly and 100% dedicated to the inside out transformation of our capacities as black people, he couldn't do the work that he does. And at the same time, I know that there are truths in American history about the nature of our system, the nature of our social, our social setup and the inequities that we experience in life that don't ever get highlighted unless a person with your passion and zeal, Hawk, um, is able to shine a light on the truth that other people will refuse to recognize. That doesn't mean that I necessarily agree with each of you gentlemen on any and all points that you would make. What it does mean is that I, as a black man and as an American, am hopeful that we can strengthen this community that the three of us and so many of us listening share, right, by being able to engage in the type of communication um, that hopefully this podcast can help, uh, help elicit, uh, but that ultimately I think is going gonna, is gonna to be necessary if we're going to build the sort of future that, that, we, want, that we want to see. Um, let, me, let, me, let me throw this at you really quick, Hawk. Um, because I feel that way about the black community, but I feel that way about America too. Hawk, we, um, you remember, of course, uh, you, uh, uh, you did us the, the pleasure and the honor of participating in a Braver Angels uh, 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 featured event a couple years back with uh, Ray Work of the Cincinnati, Cincinnati Tea Party, right? And uh, before that, uh, you spoke some words that came to the attention of folks across America at a Trump rally that you actually, uh, that, you, that you showed up to the protest, got pulled on stage, and you, you shocked America, I think, but in the most positive of ways, um, in some of, the words that you, some of the words that you said at the time. And so I wanna go ahead and pull up some of that language because it made an impact on many people, including, to be honest, myself. Um, you were up in, on a stage in front of an audience full of Trump supporters, and you said this, you said, I am an American, and the beauty of America is when you see something broke in your country, you can mobilize to fix it. We are not anti-cop. We are anti-bad cop. We don't want handouts. We don't want anything that's yours. We want our God-given right to freedom, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If we really want to make America great, we do it together. Now, I heard you just say a moment ago that, you know, there's a... Uh, that there's a lot of Republican racists out there and so forth. I understand the point of view. I can tell you, Hawk, uh, we've got a lot of folks um, within the Brave Rangers community who love you dearly, including some folks uh, on the right, some Reds and some conservatives who thought a certain way about you. And then after meeting you, after laying their hands on you, said, this man is different than what I thought. And I, and I know you've experienced that in the past. But I would like, if you don't mind, because my goal is always about getting close to that beloved community. And, you know, you said some things on Fox News recently, which, you know, I think that I can understand perhaps what you might mean, where you might be coming from, but I don't want to leave it up to my own interpretation because you talked about burning down the system and you seem to equate a little bit on whether or not that was metaphorical or literal. And I guess the thing that I'm expressing to you, Hawk, is that I feel like we're in a moment where on the one hand, the truth needs to be expressed, but on the other hand, using the power of love as it, is, as it is expressed in the gospel and in the philosophy of, of King and well beyond that, of course, there's still a need for us to sort of bring together our common humanity. Um, are you still open to that, Hawk? I mean, are you open to the idea of finding the best in Republicans and conservatives and in white folks? I'm not, I'm not primarily even asking for myself. I'm asking for folks who knew I was talking to you today, right? And who wanted to know because some of these folks felt felt something, uh, felt a connection uh, on a level and then wondered afterwards, like, you know, is, is, is Hawk not giving us a chance anymore? And so I want you to speak to that if, speak to that if you can. Um, to be perfectly honest, I'm not put here. I'm not wasting my time 
trying to convince white people that racism exists. Right. Either you understand that or you don't. It is no longer my job to try to convince you that racism exists. Things have changed dramatically since that speech to the Trump supporters at the mother of all rallies. I still come from a place of love, but I understand the frustration because I embody the frustration. You cannot allow people to live in deplorable conditions. You cannot withhold adequate food from them and allow people to live in a food apartheid in food deserts. Uh, you cannot withhold a quality education for people based on their zip code. Your zip code shouldn't be the determinant of your, your longevity of your life, right? And then to add insult to injury, all of these things that are happening, to add insult to injury, you mean to tell me if some racist cop chokes my loved one to death that nothing will happen? Now, you got George Floyd coming on the heels of coronavirus, where we saw Black people hit harder because of food injustice, right? And poor health and poor eating habits, but food injustice. People snapped. People went outside and they tore things down. They burned things. People snapped. And what I'm telling you is, the more inequality you have, and I don't even like the word equality, the more injustice you have, the more poverty you have, and the more outright acts of government sanctioned racist aggression you have, the more frustration you'll have. And when that frustration manifests itself in the streets, don't blame Hawk, because Hawk is not sending anybody out there. Hawk is literally telling you what will happen if these things continue. Mm -hmm. now, now, the president could call me treasonous. People could say what they want to say. But we all know it's the truth. People kept seeing injustice. People became, became frustrated. And people snapped. And they went out there and tore stuff up. Right? <laughs> this is the reality of it. Don't hate me for giving you the truth. And guess what? That's the American way. Right? Mm. That's the American way. People going out, making noise, being heard, and, and bringing about change. That's, that's the American way. Now that the fires are out, now that there's a more uh, 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 there's, there's a more a movement going on that's a lot more peaceful than it earlier was. Um, there's legislation being passed and pushed. Now you got to see. Everybody wants to write me off, but nobody wants to listen to my logic. Like, you know, I listened to what you had to say, sir, and you made some very good points, and I take that on board, and I'll research it and apply it. That's the way I move. But everybody wants to say, oh, Hawk, you know, why are you so aggressive? It makes no sense. Why are you saying these things? Look at American history. Look at American history. When people don't get what they want, Irish people rioted. You know, gay people rioted. Stonewall was a riot. Don't blame me. Blame the country for not fixing this. Blame yourselves. Not you, but everybody watching. Blame yourselves for not getting justice after Eric Garner. Blame yourselves because the, the cops who made a mistake and killed Breonna Taylor still, you know, are not being prosecuted. Don't blame me. Don't blame, you know, the people in the street. They're just frustrated, and they don't know another way to bring about change. Like, people are tired of holding hands and singing Negro spirituals and holding up signs and waiting for you to give them what you want. No, people are banging on that door, ready to kick the door in. And this isn't personal person violence. This isn't like a black white thing. This is a system versus citizen thing, you know? And um, I, I really think we've hit rock bottom. And I think, really think we're growing. So um, it's, it's, it's actually a great time to be alive. So yes, I'll talk to anyone. I'll negotiate with anyone. Um, but I'm, I'm not here to convince some racists that Black Lives Matter. No. Hell, I don't have the time. 
but I will have time. Hawk, you know I appreciate and respect your, your candor and the fact that honestly, man, anytime we have called on you to show up to a conversation, you've always showed up, including today. Um, one thing I think is that you know, I don't go into any conversations with folks who are coming from different places in America in politics expecting any entitlement to agreement, right? I don't expect mm -hmm. that because we're going to believe what it is we believe. At the same time, you know, we're human beings who I think we've got certain things that, that we have in common, certain things that hopefully we all care about and all share. And uh, in this conversation, Bob, I want to I want to ask you here as we as we round out to a, to a close, um, you know, what are your hopes for the for the future here? You and Hawk aren't gonna aren't gonna agree on everything uh, tomorrow. These different sides aren't gonna agree on everything tomorrow. At the same time, are there things that we share and that we do agree on that we can build on, uh, build towards going forward um, in a way that's gonna be better for all our people? Well, first of all, I. Uh... I think what we can build on, there are external challenges that we uh, have to confront. But what I really think that we're missing is I don't hear very much conversation directed to people to say to them what you must do, that the victimizer may have knocked you down, i.e. life, racism, what have you. But it's the victim's responsibility to get up. The hundreds of young men who were out shooting and robbing that we were able to bring in, they changed because they began to value their own life and the, and the life of others. And to me, the worst thing in the world is not a bigot, it is a traitor. It's when someone looks like me, gets in the position of authority and power and uses it to enrich themselves at the expense of others. I have lived for five years inside the belly of the beast. I've been inside the civil rights organizations. I've seen Nixon give the Urban League $93 million when he was in to address poverty. And I saw what was done to that with that money by wow. hundreds of people. I've, I've been inside the beast. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, the worst thing that we can say to the groups that I deal with around the country who are living in these crime-infested, drug-infested neighborhoods and building islands of excellence, I think it's dangerous to say to them that if you're killing one another, it's not your fault. Or if you are not uh, taking it, you have a right to an education, but you've got a responsibility to study. If we're not saying to someone for every right, there is a personal responsibility to respond, then I think we're crippling them. Nothing is worse than telling a, a group of people that their destiny is determined by what white people do, that you cannot make it until white people change. If they don't change, they don't give you justice, if they don't open opportunity, if they don't give you health care, if they don't give you that, then you can expect nothing else. I think that is veiled white supremacy to believe that white people, if white people were to go to Europe and Canada tomorrow, what would it change in our community? And so, no, I'm strong in believing that my people, if, if we were able to build hospitals, railroads, businesses at a time during segregation, where we're being lynched every day, if we could do it then, we can do it now. We don't have to demand or beg white people to do anything. Now, I got a question, sir. Uh, where, where are you, where's Bob your family Hawk. from? I just want to ask two, one quick question. Where's your family from? Yeah, very quick. Philadelphia. It's, it's time. Philadelphia. No roots in the South. Well, we got, oh, we yeah, got Southern yeah, roots. No, we, no. Wilmington, South Carolina, and, and, and Virginia. Uh, Farmville, okay, my family, Virginia. My family's from Allendale, South Carolina. In White Spring, White Springs, Florida, right? Mm -hmm. And what we, what, what, what both of my parents always taught me was, there's in-house conversations, and there's out-house conversations. When I'm speaking mm -hmm. out to the world, I'm not belittling black people. When I speak in to our world, into our people, then you got messages on doing for self, right? But I'm not feeding into their narrative by speaking out in the world. Oh, here's what black people need to do. That's not, they have so much. They have so many people to do that, that they don't need us to do that. 
And I don't beg them for anything. All I want is what every American has. I want equal protection under the Constitution. And you or no one else can, can't tell me that no. I can't demand equal protection under the you Constitution. You can demand it. All I'm saying, I don't think telling people that they have personal response is belittling anybody. I think it's telling, just, telling the it's masses, just, no, telling the no, audience. No, no. No. Listen, I, I don't have two truths. When, when I stood up Maybe and said truth. I was against, let me, let me just say, when I stood up and debated Julius Chambers on the whole issue of force busting for integration, I was told, oh, you shouldn't say that because the Klan agrees with it. I said anything, I don't believe that anything is all black is all bad. And mm -hmm. I said to him, at, right at before the New York Bar Association, I said to him, uh, if you have two circumstances, one is all black, but there's a presence of excellence, and B, there's diminished excellence, where should we send our kids? He said, to school B. I said, then we got nothing to debate. I, I don't think that, that, that anything is all black is all bad. And so, I mean, but, I but, but, but my point is, I tell the truth there. I don't care who agrees or disagrees with me. The truth know, is the I, truth. I understand. The truth is the truth. And let truth. me tell you that's something. That's right. When you're speaking outwardly, that's the only piece of the truth that they're going to run with. That piece where you say black people need to do X, Y, and Z, that's the only piece of the truth that they're going to run with. They have the news. They have the newspapers. They have uh, uh, social media. All these things to tell you that black people are violent. Black people need to do this. Black people need to do that. So you know what? I'm uplifting my brothers and sisters with every single word. I'm uplifting and protecting well, but, my people. But Bob, every time, ha, Bob, ha, let let me, just, guys, guys, I have to, I have to, ju I'm I have to jump in. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to jump off soon anyway. I'm, I got another point. I have to jump off. Yeah, but listen, gentlemen, I'm glad that we did this. And my hope is that this isn't the end of a dialogue. My hope is that this is the beginning, right? Not just for us, but because honestly, black people in America, I think, need it to be the case. Right? So we don't come in here feeling entitled to agreement, but if we're dedicated to the truth and uplifting our people and all our people, we got that much to build from. So for folks listening, this has been the Braver Angels podcast. You can learn more about Braver Angels and our work at braverangels.org. Bob Woodson, Hawk Newsom, um, the honor is mine, let me tell you, gentlemen. And uh, like I said, I hope we can move forward.